Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 187. I'm here with Scott Rush. Scott, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Kyle? Great. Thanks for being here. And thanks for everything you do for our profession. Well, thank you for saying that. And thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, the podcast is truly making a significant you know, difference in the uh, profession. And I'm honored to be here. We will get right back to our content, but I wanted to thank you for being such an amazing band director that you're taking your time and listening to a band director podcast. There's many options out there and I appreciate you very much taking in this content. I hope that you understand that your students are very lucky to have you as their band director, that you're continuing to grow and that they are going to benefit from your improved skills as a band director. You can share this episode with any band director friends or other music education friends who can learn from this content because good pedagogy is good pedagogy. And if you could take a moment and go to the growingbanddirector.com and you'll be able to sign up on our Patreon platform to give at least five or three dollars a month. And it helps the content continue to be created for you to help our profession grow. Let's go back to our scheduled episode. Um, so when we talk about the habits of a successful band director, right? This is a series of books and method books, and there's an institute where people can go, and and that's coming up here pretty soon, even though by the time this this comes out, it will have already happened. Um, let's do a quick plug for the Institute, like the in-person piece of that. Yeah. So the Habit Summer Institute, this is our third year. And um, I'm really excited about this year's Institute. We have people from 21 states and two foreign countries coming in. We have band, choir, and orchestra. And we have a great faculty of people, um, our Habits uh, folks. And then we bring in some additional guests. And um, it's really, um, it's small enough group that we really can get in there and, and dig into the weeds. And um, we spend as much time about uh, content as we do on culture and, and, and context. And I'm really excited about it. So yeah, it's coming up actually based on when we're recording this, it's actually coming up this weekend. So um, we use the, I wanted to pick out that word successful, right? Because I, I mean, I think that's probably a whole podcast in itself, like what what everybody deems as a successful band director is probably kind of has some shared content, but also some things that are different. So as, as one of, I know on all the books you've authored or co-authored or whatever, like what is that vision of successful in, in your mind? Well, it's interesting because I think, first of all, I like to pair with the word successful, the word significant. And um, I often say we're in the music business and the people business. It's not either or, it's and. And because of that, the word successful both uh, is, is focused on both content and context. And we want to help students be the best version of themselves. Uh, we want them to feel loved. We want them to feel successful. And with that, uh, the teacher um, needs to have both the pedagogical component uh, as well as the ability to create a culture of excellence um, where students feel loved and cared for. So it's really, it's kind of the synergy of those things. Um, it, you know, it, it really involves around um, effective communication. Uh, I, I call it knowledge, effective communication, physical energy, heart energy, and then who you are as a teacher. And those things, we, that's actually called the habit synergy model. And it's what we use to define a successful director. So you'll notice that it's not just about pedagogy. I love that because you know there are so many teachers, and I, I might be in one of these camps, I don't know, but there might be so many teachers who are great at culture, but the band doesn't sound good. Or the band sounds great, but the culture is not great, right? So I love that the mission is, um, is for both of those. You mentioned the word significant. Um, is this the, the newest book, Habits of a Significant Band Director, How Successful Band Directors Leave a Personal, uh, Musical and Personal Legacy? It is the most um, recent book that I did myself. So, okay. you know, we have a team of people, a band team of people, and we really couldn't do this without the whole team. I actually started the series back in 2004, um, and we have a, a band team of folks now made up of, you know, Jeff Scott and Marguerite Wilder and Mary Land and Kevin Boyle and Emily Wilkinson and Rich Moon and Leonard McLeod and Matthew Rao and 
Tim Lotz and Heiser and I did a pathway book together. So it takes the whole team. But your, to answer your question, the last book that I wrote was called Habits of a Significant Band Director, uh, in other words, that I didn't co-write. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the one, I was talking to my brother the other day, not the GIA would let me do this, but it's the book that if I could stand on the street corner and just hand out books and just give them <laughs> to people, it's the book that I would do that because it really explains kind of our purpose and our mission, not just in terms of, you know, the habit series, but uh, as a music educator. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, it's the, it's the one, the most recent one that I wrote myself and it's divided up into, um, you know, different, um, tears, if you will, within the book. I want to thank Austin Custom Brass for being a sponsor of today's podcast. Trent Austin started this wonderful shop back in the Boston area many years ago and has moved it to Kansas City. Check out their unique line of doublers instruments that are perfect for students, band programs, and players of all ages. The Austin Custom Brass Doublers Flugelhorn is their most popular selling instrument, available in five different beautiful finishes. These flugelhorns come with a case in Austin Custom Brass's Fab 5 mouthpiece. The Doublers Flugelhorn offers a quality sound, playability, and affordability. Get one for yourself or your whole trumpet section today. Call Austin Custom Brass at 816-410-0826. They are located in Kansas City, Missouri, but they ship all over the country and they're wonderful humans and great people to hang with. Austin Custom Brass works with band programs from all over the country. They can provide a bid to you today, work within your school's budget, and accept POs. Call their team today at 816-410-0826 or email at info at austincustombrass.com. Yeah, I just wrote down, you have the sections, the nuts and bolts of pedagogy, the interpersonal philosophy of a band director, the introspective process of a band director, successful band director, and the transcendent power of a significant band director. So there's a lot there, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading that. Yeah, and I'll break some of that down for you too. The, yeah. the, the nuts and bolts of pedagogy is really starts with something called the components of playing. And the components of playing are things like timing, tuning, tone, technique, balance, blend, articulations, dynamics, phrasing, musicianship, accuracy, clarity, all those things. And we break those things down and then we ask teachers to create something called the teaching inventory database, which is basically divided up into two columns. It's what to teach and how to teach it. And it allows teachers to um, have a system and a process for you know, implementing these things most effectively. Um, those are the, the main things under the nuts and bolts of pedagogy. And we actually break down all those components of playing. The interpersonal philosophy of a band director really starts with what I would say I would call guided questions um, where, you know, our job. Well, let me back up the old model of being a band director a long time ago was somebody standing in the front of the room telling everybody else what to do and everybody else was just really dutiful and they did exactly what they were asked to do. And we've evolved past that we, we are in a different, completely different place. And so the idea is we want to commingle ideas. We want our students to feel like they have a voice. Um, we want to train them that when they have a voice that it's based on literacy and not just a, a, a random idea. And so this idea of this um, kind of interpersonal philosophy is how do you use guided questions to allow students to commingle ideas in the classroom and between the teacher and between each other and and how to do that, you know, giving them a voice. It's also. Um, Tim Lotzenheiser uses this sometimes the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. And so the idea of, you know, how we stack and rack the music stands and chairs is how we play a musical phrase, <laughs> if that makes sense. 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah. So that that is kind of under that uh, umbrella. The introspective process in the significant book is really about the director setting goals and not just goals for uh, I, we divided up into three buckets, but not just for the person themselves, but for the program as well. And so that's kind of that uh, idea. And you can only give away what you have and the idea that, you know, we never want to stop learning. The transcendent power of a significant, significant band director is the last part of that book. And it's based on, you know, the quote, they don't care how much you know, do they know how much you care? Sure. And uh, so there's something in there we called, uh, we call freshman interviews. And it's a strategy that uh, I used at Wando High School when I was there. And so the, 
the book itself takes that habit synergy model, the thing I mentioned earlier, and focuses everything kind of towards the end and why significance is really important. And all those things collectively coming together is what creates, um, you know, significance and excellence and success. I love it. You know, in my first job, it makes me feel good that you talked about, and Dr. Tim talks about racking the stands because that's the first thing I did in that first class. Like I wanted to teach them that I cared about this and how they entered the room. So drop the backpack. We're leaving the room. We're coming in again. We're going to practice it a couple of times. And I know that's not a new concept for you or for many people, but that that intentional, how we do everything really does reflect in all the music. Um, you know, I, I know you're not aware of this, but the first time I saw you was at Midwest, I think it was 2013 potentially. Um, and you were doing a clinic and there's, I hate to say this, you did a long clinic, which was great, but there's one thing that I still to this day use in music theory class to help my kids. And I had been teaching for over 10 years and I'd never understood this. And you were doing the, it was the relationship between flats and sharps key signature in the whole, if you take two notes of the same name, like E and E flat, and that their, their flats and sharps will equal seven. That whole, like, if you have three yes. flats in this, and then E is going to have four sharps and B flat has two, and then B natural has five. Like what random thing did I pull out of that? I don't know, but you know, you never know what kids are going to get out of a, a talk. And uh, I still use that to this day. So if my kids can't remember B, they sure as heck know B flat. So then they remember that B is going to be five sharps. Yeah, Anyways. that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I love the rule of sevens. Um, we teach the rule of sevens and we also teach something called the inversion principle, which is very much related to it. So yeah, thanks for saying. Excelsior Music Publishing is proud to sponsor the Growing Band Director Podcast. As a composer-led publisher, Excelsior Music Publishing provides new music of all levels for concert band, jazz ensemble, solo and ensemble, plus method books and resources. They're known for publishing inspiring, accessible music by composers who are sensitive to and passionate about educational aspirations of young musicians. Find your perfect back-to-school music at excelsiamusic.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-C-I-A music. Dot com. Um, so you mentioned Wando uh, recently. Tell us a little bit about your career there and, and sort of how, how that led you to what you're doing now. So I was at Wando for 15 years, um, 15 year, fantastic years of my life. Uh, I absolutely loved it there. And uh, when I got there, the music making was already pretty high. The person who was there before me did a fantastic job. Um, it was, his name was Miller Aspel. He did a great job uh, at Wando. And one of the things that I felt like when I walked in the door that we could do improve was the culture. And as we started working on building the culture and taking care of each other, the numbers exponentially grew. And I had wonderful colleagues uh, to teach with and um, at one point, we had two directors, and then we had three directors, and it was just uh, a lot of things coming together to make for a good thing. Very, very supportive administration, uh, a community that was really behind arts education, and uh, it, I the, really the things that we did. Matter of fact, the very first method book that we did called Habits of Successful Musician was taken right out of the material that we used at Wando High School. And so those were fantastic years and I treasured every bit of it. You know, the, the band played at Midwest in 2007 and, and had success both in concert marching and um, we had you know, chamber ensembles and a solo competition that we did within the program. And it was really just some of the very best years of my life. and. Uh, through those experiences of collaboration with those students and the students feeling like they had a voice, um, we grew together. And because of that, um, a lot of the materials, the habits materials, came out of the experiences from Wando High School. So Scott, what, what were some of the ways that you built the culture when you went to Wando? It was really interesting. The one of the first things that I did was I established uh, a strong student leadership group, mainly centered around seniors. And I remember a young man who came into the office and he said, um, we've got to do this and we got to do this and we got to do this, we got to do this. And I said, John, 
um, you're a senior and you're on the seven month plan. And I said, I'm on the seven year plan. <laughs> and I said, we will do some of those things. But um, to be totally honest with you, my very first year at Wanda was very challenging because, um, you know, I didn't do things the way the previous director did them. And because of that, um, you know, there's always going to be that um, kind of growing pains time. And as we began to give the student leadership um, training, and it was based on relationships and love and care, um, as those things over years uh, got better and better and we gave the students more and more ownership, um, the program just itself began to thrive. And it was one of those things where because the culture continued to, um, that we're getting very consistent messages about taking, we, we actually had something, we called it taking care of the customers. And we drew a, a pyramid and on the pyramid, the bottom pyramid were freshmen. And it was the largest group uh, percentage wise. And we, we told the student leadership, our job first and foremost is to take care of the customers. And the customers were the freshmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went out of our way to really build the program from the bottom. And what I mean by that is not just taking care of them, but giving those younger students opportunities to lead themselves. In other words, you can't lead others to you lead yourself, right? And so giving them opportunities to be the best versions of themselves. And it took time, but it was so worth the effort. The other thing I'll tell you that I mentioned this earlier, so I started when I got to Wando something called the freshman interviews. It kind of went in line with this method of taking care of the customers. And uh, every Wednesday afternoon, right after school, we met with three or four freshmen or people who were new to the program. So like if you were a junior, but you moved into the program, you, you met uh, there as well. And so we did it alphabetically. It took just about the entire year. To, to meet with every single freshman. But they would come in to my office in the afternoon and the very first thing I would say to them is, if we're gonna spend the next four years together, I truly wanna to get to know you. And I really meant that. And I would ask them questions like, where do you see yourself five years from now? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Um, sometimes I would ask questions like, and you have to be careful about this question. I'll explain just a second. You know, like, what's the best vacation you've ever taken? Because um, if they do that, they would tell you about their family. You also had to know them well enough to know that everybody doesn't go on a vacation, right? And so you have to be sensitive to um, the questions you ask. But the, I, and I even did a silly question like, I'm going to go buy, I'm, we're going to go to the car dealership. I'm going to buy you a car. What kind of car would you pick out and why? Yeah. And I would also ask them questions like, what's been your best musical experience thus far? Mm -hmm. And they would tell me about not only personal experiences, but sometimes I'd say, you know, what do you listen to? You know, what, what, what are, what are your favorite bands or whatever? And, but I think the most important thing in that freshman interview was the very first thing that I said, which is, if we're going to spend the next four years together, I truly want to get to know you. First of all, I planted a seed that this was a long process. And the other thing it did is it challenged me to then do things like all about me assignments where I would follow up with them and like so if they did all about me assignment and they said you know my little brother plays trumpet in the middle school band well next time i went over to the middle school i try to find little brother right and say hey uh so uh those are the types of things that we did right off the bat at wando and over time i think um the students realized that we were just kind of all on the same team and the other thing was that the parents noticed mm -hmm. you know, they noticed the the climate and the culture and so because of that, you know, we went my very first year at Wando, we had 98 students. And when I left, we had about 290 students, um, you know, in the everyday program. We had a, a more for marching band, um, but about 290 students in the everyday program. So it was it was just a, um, a wonderful experience all the way around. And, the, you know, the music making was quite high because we continued to grow musically. Mm -hmm. And um, it was incredibly rewarding. The, the students knew, uh, I used to say, the kind of person you are is more important than the musician you become. But then I would quickly follow that up by saying, but if you're the right kind of musician, you'll mm -hmm. be the very best musician you can be. 
And so they saw from me how all that tied together. Um, I also fully believe that one of our main responsibilities is to get students to fall in love with music and music making. And in other words, it's not, um, uh, if, you, if you don't know your craft, you could be accused of being a good manager of people, not an artist. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't teach them to fall in love with music, you could teach them to fall in love with an activity, mm -hmm. not fall in love with music you know and so i really believe that all those things that's why i believe that we're in the music business and the people business and that it collides it's funny to hear you use the quote um that you used earlier and now i'm, I'm forgetting it but it's more important what you are as a person than what you are as a musician that that quote because that's in my that's one of the ones that's in my room um so as you look back on it you know you're at, at this fantastic program for 15 years and now you're past that like I've asked other people this question, this question, and their answer is relationships is kind of what was most important um, as they look back on it. Would that be your answer or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that you don't here again, I, I went through my career. I never had to, I never said, okay, we have to give a hierarchy here. You know, something has to be first. I, I've, I've always been the, um, it's and not either or. <laughs> so uh, at the end of the day, in terms of um, accomplishments and trophies and awards and places that you perform, that there's nothing that does that pales in comparison to the relationships that you build with students. And the other thing is, I want them all to fall in love with music. And I want to know like what's on their playlist. I want to know as adults, do they go to concerts? I want to know, do they still play in a church orchestra or a community ensemble? Or do they just enjoy music because they enjoy music? Um, the, the relationships, um, it's interesting. I was talking to Jeff Scott, who's one of our Habits team members last night. And he's actually going to do a session at the Habit Summer Institute this weekend about this very topic about you know what's really important and how important building those relationships and helping students be the best versions of themselves and we we started talking about at the very end of the conversation students that it took a little while for the light bulb to go on <laughs> and we just were laughing yeah. about this like there's one student who came in one day he said um i need to make an appointment with you in your office. I said, fine, how about tomorrow morning? And he comes in and he sits down and he kind of puts his head down. And, uh, I said, well, you ask, you know, just set the meeting, what, what, what's on your mind? He said, I need to apologize for my entire freshman year. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I said, apology accepted, because when he was a freshman, he was just, he, the light bulb had not gone, gone on. And it, the irony was that uh, by his junior year, he had figured it all out. It just took a little while for the light bulb to go on. And here again, those are what we ended up talking about last night were students, right? Yep. And success stories of students. And um, so it is, it's about relationships. And uh, I certainly hope and feel that the students that I taught at Wando High School not only knew they were loved and that we built great relationships, but I also um, feel that they know how important music is in their lives. Yeah. You know, people think that if it's the, it's the name of the program or the building that it's in or the director that it is, but it's really about the humans that are in a program that make it you, if you take out all the humans and put in all the new humans, that band doesn't sound like that anymore. So it's That's about exactly the people. Right. I love that. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to read uh, read a question I had I've written previously previously for you. Your uh, desire to give back to the profession through all of your professional development presentations through the years and all your works through GIA is evident. Um, where does this sort of drive to kind of help other people come from? It's interesting. Uh, first of all, I, I took a personality profile at GIA um, about a year ago, and it basically said that I was very mission mission driven. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that, you know, we're put here to make a difference. And through the habit series, um, we really believe that 
uh, our job is to make a difference in the lives of teachers to then exponentially make a difference in the lives of their students. And the, the resources are there. I always say it's, it's not the exercise, but it's the teaching behind the exercise and it's the teacher behind the teaching of the exercise that makes the, the kind of uh, where excellence is created. And so our job in terms of resources is to allow the teacher to amplify those things that they think are important. Um, so it's, it's not the exercise, but it's, and it's the teacher. And one of the things that's been really interesting to me is I've done enough professional development sessions now where I've seen situations where a group of teachers have heard the exact same words in a professional development session, exact same words, exact same experiences. And there are certain teachers who will take it and run with it and other teachers who do not. And so it wasn't the words, it wasn't the exercises, it's what the teacher did with that information. So the more I do this, the more I realize that I think it's about 80% behavior from the teacher. Um, we can give them the resources and we can sequence them properly. We can give them systems and processes. We can give them supplemental resources that we think will be really, really beneficial. But at the very end of the day, it's about the teacher. I'll tell you a, a quick story that I thought was kind of funny. So the very first method book we did, Habits of Successful Musician, this was back in, I think, 2009. And we field test all of our method books. And so we, we send them out to people, and then we get feedback over the course of that year, and then we make all the changes, and then we release the book. And so at Midwest that particular year, I met with two directors who were field testing that first method book. And that, those were the things that we were doing at Wando at the time. So I'd been using them for six or seven years. And so I met with the first director uh, at Midwest and I said, you know, tell me your overall feelings about the method book. And he said, I love the rhythm vocabulary and I love the sight reading in the book. He said, there's two sections of sight reading. I love it. We, we have sight read something every day. We've done some, some type of rhythm vocabulary every day. And it has made a tremendous difference in my program. And I said, fantastic. I said, what do you think of the warm up material, the fundamental warm up material in the front of the book? And he said, well, to be totally honest with you, we've done a few of those exercises, but I've been so excited about the sight reading. We've just lived in the rhythm, <laughs> the sight reading section. So I was like, great, fantastic. Literally 20 minutes later, I meet with the second director and I asked the exact same question. I said, um, just give me your overall impressions about the method book. And he immediately said, I love the warm up material in the front of the book. I love the fundamentals. I love the way it's paced. It's made my ensemble sound better. We've done, you know, a little bit of the rhythm vocabulary, but we have just re completely transformed the way we do fundamentals time. And he set up and I said, what do you think about the sight reading in the back of the book? And he said, well, to be honest with you, we've done a few sight readings, but we really just kind of lived in the front of the book and totally done the opposite. fundamentals material. And I realized at that moment, I thought, okay, it, it said two things to me. One is I thought maybe we had a decent method book, yeah. uh, that it had potential to be really successful because um, the way they were using it. But the second thing, it reiterated again to me that it's about the teacher. So yeah. our job is to provide resources um, and we are very missional in our thought, but to provide resources that will make a difference in the lives of teachers and, and their students, but it's still always about the teacher. So along that line, I have a question that just that just came up um, through that. The So a, a, a consistent warm-up is very important. Like what we do in our warm-up is obviously something that's very important. However, I've also seen programs where they do exactly the same warm-up every single day with zero variation and the kids are completely checked out. So like... what? What are some ways or what is the kind of secret sauce in making it varied day to day, but also, you know, having the same principles? All right. So first of all, you're, you're spot on because that is correct. Yeah. Uh, I always say it should never be mindless repetition and that everything should be a performance. And if you use the components of playing, those things that I talked about earlier, as your guiding principles. So, you know, timing. So, for instance, let's just say you're playing like a descending, like a Remington exercise, as an example. And then you say, okay, what has to be true for, for this to be successful? Well, you have to breathe together. The attack has to be together. 
you have to play with good tone. You have to change notes together, so timing, tuning. If you're doing it with a full ensemble, it has to be balanced. It has to be blended. It's, I could keep going down the list, right? And so what, happen, what happens then, if we use the components of applying as our guiding light, and we realize that everything we do, starting from the beginning, in terms of how we sound, and the very first sounds of the day should be a performance, those two things together, uh, along with showing enough variety where you're working on specific components. And so the teacher um, can guide what needs to happen, both in terms of what the teacher's hearing from the ensemble, maybe what you're doing later in the rehearsal. Um, we have a formula, we say 50% of rehearsal should be spent on fundamentals time. So 50% fundamentals, 50% on literature or whatever else that you're doing. Um, but it should never be mindless repetition and it should always be based on the components applying and what you're trying to troubleshoot. Because when I say troubleshoot, I don't mean the teacher troubleshooting it. I mean the students troubleshooting it and the students having say in what they heard. So literally a student, you know, you could do a particular exercise and say, okay, what did you hear? You know, tell me, what did you hear? Or you could ask a guided question like, hey, what should we be matching? You know, just as an example, what should we be mm -hmm. matching? And those guided questions are so important. And, you know, I have, I agree. With, so to give you two flip sides of this, I have gone into situations where um, someone, a real specific situation, someone asked me to come in and do an observation and they wanted to me to observe their class. And then after we would talk during their planning period. And I went in and the first thing they did was turn on a metronome somebody got up on the podium, gave just a downbeat and sat back down and they played through a series of things. Um, and the teacher was selling reads, taking attendance. You know, I could go through the whole list yeah. of, you know, doing things on the computer when they were done, then class started. And there's, you know, that's not based on anything with regard to the components applying. It doesn't, um, there's no listening happening, no active listening happening. Um, I've also seen a situation where so many guided questions were asked that the pacing of the rehearsal bogged down. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, kind of a blended idea of, and you, you know, the teacher, the, the artistry of the teacher reading the room, knowing the students, knowing whether they have enough literacy at the moment to make informed decisions or is more literacy training necessary to then have those really active guided questions and guided responses that are based on, um, you know, whether it's rhythm vocabulary or whether it's oral literacy or whether it's the components applying. Um, and by the way, we have a thing we call the three buckets and that's, those are the three buckets, rhythm vocabulary, oral literacy, and the components applying. And so, those are guiding principles for us in terms of what the students know and are able to do. I, I love that you're talking about, I'll put it in different words, basically not letting them sound bad, even from the very beginning, right? Um, right. My, my wife is a fantastic middle school teacher, and I'm lucky enough to be able to teach the students that she sends up. And she's been that way her whole career. She's like, I can't listen to this. Like, I can't listen to something that doesn't sound good. So, so she'll say to people who might have um, bands where the tone isn't very good. You know, it's just, they haven't spent time on, if we talk about tone, you know, just, I love that message. I wanted to highlight it that, you know, let make sure your kids are sounding good every day from the beginning, because it doesn't matter if it's a warm up or a piece or in performance or in practice, they will be the way that you, you know, demand that they are musically. That is correct. Yes, absolutely. Scott, how did you make your first connection with GIA? So it's really interesting the very first book was called Habits of Successful Band Director. And Tim Lotzenheiser used to come to Wando High School for several years to do student leadership workshops. And he and I obviously developed a friendship through all that and we're still dear friends. And one year I picked him up at the airport, we were driving in the car and we were talking about student teachers. He was observing student teachers um, as an adjunct uh, professor at Vander Cook and at Duquesne, I think, at the time. 
And I had picked him up at the airport. I had a student teacher at the time, and we were t sharing notes about what we were observing with student teachers. And he just very haphazardly said, you should write a book. And I thought, well, that's Tim making me feel good because that's what Tim does. <laughs> mm. And about six months later, we saw each other at a particular event. And he said, where's that manuscript? And I said, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. He said, matter of fact, if you'll write a book, he said, I'll make sure it gets published. And at the time he was working with a company called Focus on Excellence. It's the people who did the breathing gym and, mm -hmm. you know, he was associated with them. And so the very first version of the book was actually published by Focus on Excellence. And at Midwest that year, they sold a lot of copies really quickly. And right after Midwest, Tim called and he said, hey, I would like to um, pitch this idea of GIA publications picking up the book. They're a much bigger publisher. They have much bigger ability to distribute the book. And would you like to you know, make that connection to create that partnership? And I said, if you think that would be a good idea, I said, I'm all about it. And about 10 minutes later, Alec Harris, who's the president of GIA, called and said, you know, Tim and I have been talking. We'd like for you to publish with us if you're interested. And so they picked up the book um, from Focus on Excellence. They republished it, Habits of Successful Band Director. And literally this whole series probably would have never happened had Tim Lotzenheiser not said, hey, you should write a book. Because I can tell you, that I, I did not grow up saying, I'm going to write books or I'm going to write <laughs> method books. I, that would, I matter of fact, I probably would have laughed if you said that when I was younger, but it was Tim's encouragement and then Tim's making that connection with Alec Harris that then allowed uh, the relationship to happen. And also your willingness to kind of follow that path that was being put in front of you. You know, it's funny. I almost had deja vu when you're talking because in September, I, I interviewed Peter Boonshaft and he had like just the same thing. Like, I forget who it was, but somebody came to him about writing the book and he said, no, I can't. And, and then they followed up later. Are you serious? Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that was funny. Yeah. It, and <laughs> Tim, um, you know, continued to encourage, but it's matter of fact, one of the things I said to him in the first book, I said, then you write the forward and he wrote the forward to the first book. Yep. Uh, the things with GIA, the, the projects that we've had happen, and there have been many, there are 18 books in the series now. Wow. And the projects that we have done have all come from what we felt like was a need or someone, you know, coming to us saying, hey, you should, you know, uh, consider writing this kind of uh, book. And so the method books were actually written in reverse. We wrote the Habits of Successful Musician, which was the first band book. And it's the material we're using at Wando. Then we wrote Habits of a Successful Middle School Musician, which, by the way, we're getting ready to change the title to Habits of Successful Middle Level Musician because so many high schools are using yep. the yellow book, what we call the yellow book, that we wanted to just kind of make it more, you know, the content is exactly the same. And then we wrote Habits of Successful Beginner Band Musician. Um, and we wrote them, it was interesting, we wrote them in reverse order, but the great thing about it is we always knew where we were writing to. So in terms of sequence, we knew where we were going. And that's how the method books came about for band. So Scott, what's a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about what's in that, um, the middle school, or as you say, middle level method book. So it's very similar to the high school book in terms of the concepts, but it's on a much easier level. And we took the work that Jeff Scott was doing at Cario Middle School, and we started adapting it in terms of rhythm, vocabulary, and some other things. So one of the, the immediate differences that you'll notice with the yellow book is in the middle, there are rhythm vocabulary exercises where you have 58 rhythms followed by the same rhythm and pitches. And we really noticed that was kind of like that moment where the students and it, it sounds like such a simple concept because you would think if you handed out a piece of music and it has pitches, but you counted it first, it would do the same thing. But that's actually not true. There's actually something about dividing it up into one component at a time and really teaching it um, to be rhythmically literate and then putting pitches with it. So that is uh, something that's really unique to that particular book. 
And then also there's some really valuable resources in the back um, along with this, just the idea, you know, one of the things that people told us about the high school book and the yellow book is everything's under one cover. So they're fundamental exercises, but you have warm ups, you have corrals, you have chord progressions, you know, you have lip slurs, you have uh, all these various things, you know, dynamic exercises, you have the sight reading, you have the rhythm vocabulary that I just talked about. And so those are the things uh that are somewhat unique to that yellow book and it really does give the teacher the opportunity to pick from various sections in the book um, the other thing we have um, is we have a glossary in the back that's uh, aligned to um, various exercises that are in the same key as an example mm -hmm. so you could go through and you, you could say hey if i wanted to reinforce this particular key look in the back of the conductor's edition, it'll tell you the exercises that you can use to bear that out. So, and there, and there are rubrics there and there's solfege exercises, extra percussion there in the back of that yellow book as well. And I love now that you said it's pretty becoming pretty popular, the beginner level book as well. Yeah, so Habits of Successful Beginner Band Musician, um, we really feel like it's been a great contribution. Um, there are many, many, many programs really around the world who are using that beginner method right now. Some of the things that are unique about the book is first, the, the first 23 pages of the conductor's edition really talk about how to get your program set up from day one before you put instruments in students' hands. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we set students up properly. And so the first 23 pages are really our system. We call it the habits beginner first steps, but it's, it's really divided up into rhythm vocabulary, um, simple diatonic solfege. We, call, we have a chart called first day's rhythm charts, we have another chart called first day's solfege. And then uh, we have teaching note names and then air playing and then small instrument work, and then the first sounds on the instrument. And it's really laid out in like 10 sequences. And then we have something called habitsuniversal.com, which by the way, has free resources. Anybody can go to habitsuniversal.com and pull under the resources tab and pull those resources. But it's where, so for instance, I'll take rhythm vocabulary as an example. You have a first day's rhythm chart. It's paired with a supplemental rhythm chart on habitsuniversal.com. And then you graduate into uh, an example into the book that has the rhythm followed by the same rhythm and pitches. And so it's very sequential, um, it's very intentional, and there's just so many supplemental tiers. And then of course, because it's a beginner book, we have accompaniment tracks and coaches videos, and, and we're just very intentional about the sequencing uh, and the pacing of the book. Um, I'll tell you, one of the things that we have um, teachers tell us is that they'll say my students are more rhythmically literate they'll say my ensemble sounds more mature they'll say uh, my clarinets are going over the break sooner my students understand key signatures better um, they're more musically sensitive and so we feel really good about the impact that habits of successful beginner band musician is making uh, you know for beginners question I have, because I've heard my wife who teaches beginning band talk a lot about different method books. And one of the things that she struggles with is finding one that has, that has a correct number of repetitions, you know, like sometimes it'll introduce a new note and then boom, it's gone on to something else. And there isn't enough repetition in that. So, you know, how, how much repetition is in your book? So, yeah. So we are really big on taking one concept and remediating that concept over and over again. Um, I will tell you that one of the reasons why we have supplemental materials uh, on habitsuniversal.com is you can't write a method book, truly write a method book, and remediate it as much as you need to. Mm -hmm. So like I'll give you an example. When they learn the first three notes, we have something on Habits Universal called Three Note Songs. And not only do we encourage the teachers to do those additional 12 exercises, but we also encourage them to do solfege with those exercises. And when students are just having to worry about me, Ray, and Do, they'll sing. And if you start singing from the very beginning, we believe that for oral literacy to truly happen, students need to sing. Um, if you've ever been in a, a you know, a situation, I, I'll just use this as an example. If you've ever judged an audition where brass players had to sight read 
we've all been in the situation where we hear brass players get on the wrong partial and they're just on the wrong partial and they'll just kind of live there. Well, part of what we have to do is we have to teach them to see what they hear and hear what they see. And so we're really big on, on that as an example. Uh, I will tell you one thing that's really interesting about the book and I wouldn't say it's controversial. It's just that if people would read the additional teacher tips, they would understand <laughs> additional <laughs> teacher tips from habitsuniversal.com. So, First of all, if you just started at the beginning of the book, you handed the book out and you just started at number one, um, that's the least effective way to use the book. Those first 23 pages and the supplemental resources that we give you set you up to go into number one. The other thing that we have that's in the book that's very unique that we are really proud of, and it's based on something that we've been doing for years, is we have something called sequence teaching. So every once in a while in the book, and we actually tell the teachers and the additional teacher tips on Habits Universal where these occur, some of them. And they're also in the additional teacher tips at the bottom of the page. We have something called, we call a culminating exercise. And the culminating exercise is where we put more than one component of applying together. But what we do when we do that is we'll have instructions for the teacher and we'll say, First time, I'll just use this as one example. First time, just go through and play right notes and rhythms. Okay, next time, go through and just do the articulations. Next time, go through and just do the dynamics. Um, and then the fourth time through, do a simultaneous performance. Now, why is that important? Number one, if we can teach students to use the components of playing, even as beginners, they will practice better. So when they're on their own, they're practicing at home, we've taught them a skill. And they've heard those vocabulary words. So they've heard the words of articulation, dynamics. The next thing is that in many cases, teachers will give out concert music even by Christmas, uh, their first year. And if they do that, many teachers are finding that if they don't use this approach, that when they hand out a piece of music, they're actually having to start from scratch. Sure. And in many cases, they have to go almost measure at a time to uh, accomplish where if they've been using this idea where we take one concept, we remediate that concept over and over and over again, then we give them a culminating exercise and then we break that culminating exercise down to its individual components. Then we're teaching them how to apply the individual components. That's built into the book and we have found that um, it's one of the reasons why people feel that their ensembles are getting better and better. Well, Scott, thanks so much for um, spending the time and, and sharing everything. How can people reach out to you if they're looking to contact you? So there are a couple of different ways. First of all, if you go to www. I guess you don't have to say that anymore, do you? Habitsofsuccess.com. <laughs> yeah, habitsofsuccess.com. There's a way to contact me. Also, um, Scott R at GIA music.com uh, is the best way to reach out to me. Great. Um, who's a composer or two that you really care about that you want people to know about? So there are a couple. Um, especially composers that maybe people don't know, um, maybe as well. I love Kataj Copley's work. Um, he's a young new composer. He's done Halcyon Hearts and Dope and some other pieces um, that are great. And uh, I also wanna kind of flip this around too. So James Stevenson, um, Jim Stevenson is a composer who First of all, he and I went to school together at New England Conservatory. We played in a brass quintet together. He's a fantastic trumpet player. And he has, he's a full-time composer now. And he's written some amazing works for band. The Marine Band has played several of his pieces. And, um, but what I want people to kind of dig into is he has written many, many other things, including like pieces for the Chicago Symphony, uh, pieces for, for the San Francisco Ballet. He's written a chamber works. Uh, he's got one that is kind of uh, the, the, the sequel or prequel, I don't, I'm not sure, to L'Histoire uh, that uh, is called The Devil's Tale that he has done that's really amazing. And he's written some solo works for some of the most well-known musicians in the world. And so check out um, James Stevenson, check out his work. Uh, his band pieces are fantastic, and he's written 
pieces for younger band. Um, he did a, um, a fanfare for this based on stars and stripes, essentially. Um, and he's also done several like pop type tunes that are very accessible. Uh, and I love his, he's a fantastic musician and uh, I love all of his music. Beautiful. Thank you. So what are, what are a couple pieces you'd like people to know about? So just pieces that I resonate with, like things that yeah. I, that I like. So yeah. I, I, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to give you a couple. Um, of course I have to say Lincoln Charposi because of, uh, it's monumental influence on what we do. And I mean, I used to sing that to my kids. <laughs> um, uh, I also uh, love Omar Thomas's Come Sunday, mm. uh, just a fantastic work. Uh, I also, I, I love Armenian Dances Part One, uh, it, based on just some performances that we've done uh, where the kids just had fun. And it was just based on having fun making music. And then there's a, a little gem that I absolutely love. It's um, Guy Forbes' Onata Luke's. And that's certainly a piece that can be played with younger ensembles. Um, you know, it, it has students um, making really, really good sounds. I did it with my adult ensemble at the last concert we played. And it was interesting because um, not many of them knew the piece. And it's a wonderful piece. Very, it's just very lyrical and very beautiful. And um, it's just one of those pieces that, you know, touches your heart. And we're going to end with that. Scott, thanks very much. We're going to listen to that piece. And I just appreciate you being with us. Thank you again for the very kind invitation. It was great being with you. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. 
If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.